Hey, good morning, Nevada. Welcome to our community coffee for this week. We're doing things a little bit differently, and we have a couple guests with us this morning um, that we're really excited to have. So um, we're, we'll do go around and do some quick introductions, and we'll kind of talk about um, what we're going to discuss this morning, and then we'll just dive right into the conversation. So as most of you know, uh, my name is Brett Barker, and I'm privileged to serve as your mayor. Um, and now we will go over to uh, Councilman Spence. Hello, Luke Spence, City Councilman here uh, in Nevada. Jerry? Yep, you bet. Uh, and on my uh, little uh, photo thing, it says Herbert Hoover. I am not Herbert Hoover. <laughs> uh, but uh, anyway, I, I Jerry Flegel, and I'm President and CEO of the uh, Hoover Presidential Foundation. I'm glad to be here today. And we have Tim. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Tim Walsh, and I was the director of the Hoover Presidential Library from 1993 to 2011, about 18 years, and uh, worked for the National Archives and Records Administration for 33 years in all before retiring. Very good. And so kind of where this came about, we've been doing the community coffees. They've been pretty successful. And then about probably a week and a half ago, Jerry was supposed to be here in Nevada presenting live to our community about the Presidential Foundation, the library, what it does for Iowa. Um, and unfortunately that couldn't happen. So we thought, you know, let's just bring Jerry here virtually and we'll have a good conversation and kind of replicate some of that that we were gonna do in person a few weeks ago. So um, I don't think, one of the things that kind of struck me is I think how much of a hidden gem we have here in Iowa. Luke Spence and I have bonded over our mutual interest in presidential history. We both have read a lot of the same biographies, been to some of the same presidential sites. And so it's something that, that we both enjoy learning about. And I know when I was in college at the University of Iowa, I think I drove by that Hoover Library one, about once a week for six years and never stopped, not knowing how close and accessible it actually was. Um, and then the other thing that struck me is having just some of the interest and in my favorite class in high school is AP US history. And so I always enjoyed that. But when I first visited the library, you know, I still had that mindset of Hoover, Great Depression, and that's about the end of my understanding. And that was one of the things that really surprised me was how much more there was there at the library and what the legacy actually entailed. So um, definitely appreciate having you both here with us this morning. So maybe if we start out with a real high level, the foundation is what it does and then what the libraries are. Sure, well, well uh, th yeah, thank you, Brett. So yeah, the Hoover Presidential Foundation, it's a private uh, 501c3 nonprofit uh, foundation. And the purpose of the foundation is uh, to support the Library Museum, the Hoover Presidential Library Museum, and the Hoover Historic Site. And, in a, and, and it really, I call spread the word of uh, Herbert Hoover and what his accomplishments were in life. As, as you said, there's, there's a, always a lot of misconceptions as far as about Herbert Hoover on that. So uh, we really tried to focus uh, what, you know, and Tim can talk a little bit too about it, but the Library Museum uh, is basically how it, how it uh, began in all presidential library museums are the, the funds are raised privately and then they're gifted to the federal government and uh, the National Archives then takes ownership of them. And of course the National Archives then manages and runs them and so forth like that. But the, the, the line of delineation is um, in essence, they don't have money for any programming, special exhibits. I call any of the real extras that really make the experience great. And so that's where the foundation comes in and, and we supply the funds and the help and so forth like that to do those kinds of things uh, on there. And of course, the same for the uh, Hoover Historic Site, which is uh, 186 acres total uh, right there, off, right off, basically steps off the interstate, uh, interstate 80 in, in uh, Iowa City, or just east of Iowa City. Right if it weren't there. for the natural barrier, you could see it from the interstate. I don't think people understand that. <laughs> yeah, and actually, actually, the prairie, the, the natural grass, tall prairie, abuts the uh, uh, interstate on there. So yeah, people do not realize, I mean, you, yeah, really, you come into West Branch and you can't miss it because you have to drive through the park to get into West Branch. <laughs> That was a source of real confrontation early on because the road of access, uh, Parkside Drive is actually a federal highway and uh, there have been very aggressive uh, law enforcement agents of the National Park Service who's issued tickets to longtime <laughs> residents, including the football coach in West Branch. So that was where you had federal local friction from time to time. <laughs> In my years, uh, of course, a lot of the Park Service people have come and gone over the years, but it's a great, as Jerry will tell you, a great boon and an asset 
to have a federal facility in a local community. It means that people have this wonderful park to walk and to uh, basically uh, recreate. Uh, they do extraordinary programs. And as, as Jerry uh, really touched upon, the whole premise of presidential libraries and presidential sites is predicated on the idea that as presidents have left office, they've donated their papers and memorabilia to the federal government with the idea that the government would uh, then maintain those, those properties and materials. And it really goes all the way back to George Washington. The library system is relatively new in the sense that it starts with Franklin Roosevelt in 19, late 1930s. He decides he wasn't gonna give his papers to the Library of Congress. Most of the presidential families, not the presidents themselves, but their families eventually had donated these papers to the Library of Congress at the request from the library. So there are 22 presidents whose papers are represented there. But beginning really with Herbert Hoover, really even Calvin Coolidge, these papers migrated to, uh, to other locations. Uh, and so Hoover's went to Stanford, for example, Coolidge's went to several places, even frankly, going back farther than that, a lot of, of Theodore Roosevelt's materials ended up at Harvard. Some of his uh, of uh, Wilson's materials ended up at Princeton, uh, Taft's at, at, at Yale. What Roosevelt did in 19, oh, late 1930s was make a decision to build at his own expense a what he called a library. It wasn't really a library. He liked the term. It was an archives and a museum. And he essentially said, I'm going to build this at my family home in Hyde Park, New York, and uh, set this up and uh, uh, you know, offer the public the opportunity to come and see the various gifts and, and materials I've given to the government to use the papers. Well, he established a precedent. Going forward from there, Truman leaves office. He takes with him an enormous body of materials under common law. It's his property. He takes it with him and, uh, and begins to lobby for a presidential library. Uh, the friends of the president go forward and so forth. Well, of course, Eisenhower's in office. They don't share a political philosophy. But one thing that, that presidents all share is a sizable ego and a desire to have a building named in, in, in their honor. And so uh, Eisenhower agrees to sign the Presidential Libraries Act in 1955. And, uh, you know, that, that's the beginning of a system. You get Truman's library established in 57. Eisenhower's opens in 1962. As you know, Herbert Hoover's opens in 1962. And then every president thereafter has started to plan their presidential library almost the day after they, they're sworn into office. And although I've not heard a thing about the Trump presidential library, I assume uh, there's probably somebody, maybe a lower level staff person in the White House, who's beginning to think, where will we locate this library? Uh, you know, should it be in Florida? Should it be in New York? Where should it be? And of course, we're still waiting. I think even waiting the groundbreaking. Jerry may know about this. I don't know that the, pres the Obama presidential center is supposed to be in downtown Chicago, I think in, in uh, uh, one of the major parks. Uh, it will be totally private, interestingly enough, maintained privately by their foundation. They will have a node, as they say, where you can access the presidential documents. So we're going to come into a new relationship. And as time has gone on, as Jerry will tell you, the foundations have be taken a greater and greater role, not only just in um, uh, providing public programs and conferences and educational programs, which are all very important. That's the intersection with the general public, but also in raising money for more uh, maintenance issues, for preservation projects and things that are kind of uh, back of the house kind of projects that in the past had been paid for by the by the federal government. So it's an interesting collaboration. And I like to say too, it's, it's really been a great co cooperative effort between the private sector, the public sector, between federal, state and local governments. So it's a really unusual relationship among and between a, a number of different entities. So I'll, I'll, I'll flip it back to Jerry for, for uh, new, for sports and weather. <laughs> and Luke, feel free to hop in if you have any questions as well, yeah. or anything you want to talk more about too um I, i'll kick it off with a question if you don't mind go I, for it for the two of you what what attracted you to uh either hoover or the presidential library what got you involved uh in the beginning 
Tim, I'll let you go first. Well, uh, you know, it, it's been very interesting. I, I, of course, studied history all my life. Uh, going back, my earliest memory of, of having an interest in history goes back probably to the fifth grade. But going forward, I started a career at the National Archives, did a lot of different things. I was a budget analyst for a while. I was a grants analyst. I was an archivist. I was an editor of their magazine. And I was offered the opportunity to come to West Branch. And just like Brett said, my knowledge of Herbert Hoover, even though I have a PhD in American history, my knowledge of Herbert Hoover essentially was limited by the worst four years of his life, which were his, his presidency. And I said, can I embrace this man and celebrate his life and go forward and share it with others, uh, I need to know more about him. So I did a kind of a deep dive into the biographies and, and did a lot of learning and said, this is an extraordinary life that's underappreciated and, and mischaracterized. And so when offered the opportunity to come to uh, back to Iowa, my wife and I and family were living in Virginia. I was born and raised in Michigan, went to school in Indiana and Illinois. So I never came to Iowa, but the magic elixir was my wife's family goes back in Iowa history uh, to pioneer days. So uh, she had a very positive attitude toward Iowa. We, we were looking for a wonderful place to come and raise our boys. And uh, so everything came together to come to West Branch. And they were the most remarkable years. I came in 88 as assistant director uh, under Richard Norton Smith. If, if you've been here, particularly in the late 80s, early 90s, you'll remember that red haired fellow, as they used to call him, who uh, he was he was like a, 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 a like a traveling salesman like uh, Henry Hill. You know, he he got everything up to date in, in River City and uh, and then and then left town. <laughs> and I sometimes feel like. You know, you remember the, 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 the tent show where the evangelist comes and saves everybody and then moves on and it's left to the local pastor to try to hold on to all those converts. And so that was that's the challenge for uh, for presidential libraries. When, in fact, people come to a presidential library the first time, as I'm sure you guys have been, you're amazed. Well, then the challenge is, is as Jerry well knows, it's getting you to come back. So to drive from Nevada to West Branch two, three, four times a year is, is a challenge. It's a challenge for every presidential library. Uh, we at, at Hoover were blessed by having an extraordinary family, the Hoover family. And that's another element to the, to the picture that's, that's important is how supportive are they? How difficult are they? Some of the presidential families have sizable egos and they don't like to know that the Clinton library has got more visitors than th their library or what have you. And some are very generous in saying, here's our, my time, here's the, the money. And, and, and Jerry and, and all of you well know, if you know Margaret Hoover, you know Alan Hoover. And in my time, Pete Hoover, Herbert Hoover III, was, was just a tremendous sort, a, a source of support, a real mentor. So that's where it started with me, going back to the fifth grade. I'm 72 now, so it's over 50 years, well, more than that, 60 some years of, of interest in history. And, uh, and doing events like this, even at nine o'clock on a Saturday morning is a real joy. Well, uh, and, and, and for me, I am a uh, native of West Branch. I actually, I, I, well, I moved there when I was four years old, grew up in West Branch, graduated from West Branch High School, actually ran and managed the grocery store on uh, Main Street for seven years, and then uh, ultimately went and bought my own stores and uh, owned and operated those. And then I ended up uh, running the Iowa Grocery Industry Association for 15 years. And so then when the opportunity came up for, uh, at the, that time it was called the, the Hoover Library Association, um, and basically that opening came up and it was an opportunity I called it to, to come home. So, um, so basically I, I came back and it was seven years ago on there. So, um, and it's really been neat, uh, you know, being able to come back and, you know, got to love a history, but you know, I can relate to Tim. I have learned so much more just since I took this job and, and, uh, and the Hoover family is great to work with. We have six Hoover family descendants that are on the board of trustees. Uh, we've got their only living grandson, uh, Andy Hoover, and of course, then Margaret and Alan, and they're very great to work. They're excellent to work with. One of the points too that Jerry made, I'll just add this in is, Jerry is a certified association manager, association executive, and it's really important in these relationships to use the skills that association management teaches you to, to build your constituency. Very good. I think that's a good question too, as far to maybe have Luke answer, you know, how you got interested in the presidential libraries and things like that. Oh, wow. Well, for me, uh, I, I'm, I'm a lot like, uh, like uh, Tim, I have had a 
um, interest in history my whole life, but uh, uh, I'm an airline pilot by trade and uh, that comes with a fair amount of time sitting in hotels and plenty of time to read. And I started maybe seven or eight years ago reading presidential biographies, started at Washington and went all the way down. Um, and, and that's really kind of, you know, that's more of a symptom of my, my, my love of history than, than anything, but that's what got me involved, uh, in, in learning about Hoover more than anything, because he's kind of one of those presidents that served one term. There's not a whole lot, uh, of information out there when it comes to, uh, the number of books, you know, you, you look at a Lincoln or a, a Washington, you could find entire shelves, but, uh, there's not a lot about Hoover, but they're one of, he's one of those presidents that is really, uh, his whole life is, is very interesting, um, um, is before presidency, post presidency, and even and during presidency is uh, are 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 really pretty captivating when when history hasn't really done him justice in that respect. But yeah, that I did, I've I've always been a history buff. I, you can see a lot of my books behind me that you know I, that I that I keep it on my my bragging shelf there. But um, it, it's uh, yeah, it, um, presidential history is kind of my hobby outside you know when I'm outside of work. So always trying to read something from somebody. Yeah, and I think I'm kind of the same. I remember being a kid and being interested in, in things like that. And I remember my dad even talking about Bush Dukakis back in 88 when I was in preschool and kind of being becoming aware of what what even that that meant, the presidency. And fast forward then in 2007, I took a road trip with um, one of my friend's families down to Florida. And at the time, you know, I grew up doing lots of road trips and my dad was a type that you had to prep him an hour before you thought you might need to go to the restroom and stop. <laughs> So, so, but uh, my friend's family was more of a, let's plan fun stops. So they planned to stop at the Carter Library and, and outside of, or in Atlanta. Um, and that was my first presidential library. And since then, I've been able to visit all except for Clinton. So after, after COVID, you might see me take a short trip down to Little Rock or something, but I've been able to make it to all the other National Archives ones and even started to go to the presidential sites outside of that system. So it's, I think it's a unique um, opportunity to have that history preserved in the way it has been. So maybe a next topic before we talk about what it means to Iowa now, maybe we can talk a little bit about the legacy so then people understand more about why we need to preserve it here. Tim, you want to go on that? Okay. Uh, I'm always reluctant to start talking because as you can hear, I tend to pontificate and go on <laughs> at length and blah, blah, blah. So Stop me before I talk again, as they say. But yes, I, the, there, there is an important legacy. We are a young nation. And compared to other countries, certainly the, the European countries, which have a deep, long uh, historical tradition, cultural tradition, and the national government has often has a department of culture in which they put uh, hundreds of millions of dollars into the preservation of sites and archaeology and, and great documentation and art and so forth. We as a nation essentially have said, we're, we're reinventing ourselves. We're a nation that we are cre created from people who are dissatisfied essentially with Europe or with other locations, and we're going to build a new nation. And so when it came to our history, uh, going back even before the 18th century, the idea was we think preservation is a good thing, but we're generally going to leave this uh, for the most part. To the, to the private sector. And so our great museums and universities, yes, of course, we do have state support in some cases, but in many cases they're paid for with, with private funds. And so what you have with the presidency, because we're always looking for role models for our children, who do, who do we point to to say, here, use this individual as somebody who will guide your own life and values. We have often gone to the presidents. Not every president has been a great man. Uh, some were coarse scoundrels. Many were, were uh, had great aspirations that they couldn't achieve. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, we say, these are people whose lives mattered and we want our children and grandchildren to know about them. And the way we've done it, of course, is to focus on uh, what their, their legacy is. What, what have they left? Whether it's documentation or uh, you know, uh, things that they've uh, they acquired. What I find most interesting is the, the abiding interest that many Americans have in visiting birthplaces. Uh, uh, you know, and, and not unlike uh, any situation where you say, where does this greatness begin? People wanna visit the homes, if they still exist, of, the, of where these presidents have been born. In fact, Brian Lamb and Richard Norton Smith did this uh, book uh, called, I think, Who's Buried in Grant's Tomb? Uh, and, and essentially what these uh, 
what, what it is, is a kind of a triptych of visiting grave sites and birthplaces. And uh, people just have a, a continuing interest in doing it. In fact, uh, a poor Grover Cleveland, as I recall, I think he's buried in a, in a closed cemetery in uh, Princeton, New Jersey. And, and as I recall, people are constantly leaping an iron fence just to go and pay their respects at Cleveland's grave. I mean, that shows you the extent to which people feel they have to tick off uh, which, uh, which sites they visited. So there is this strong and continuing interest. It's interesting to note that the 13 presidential libraries in the federal system, that's from uh, Roosevelt, on, well, Hoover on in terms of chronology, uh, attract about a million visitors a year. And that's about half of the total visitation to National Archives facilities. About a million people visit uh, the, the Washington facilities where they see the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution and the great documents in the hall there next to the Smithsonian. But another million will do as Brett has done, and that is travel around the country from Boston to Austin to Simi Valley and visit these various presidential libraries. Very cool. So maybe let's talk a little bit about Hoover and what his legacy is and kind of what he did outside of what you mentioned, the, the four years of the Great Depression that everybody thinks of right away. Okay, Jerry. Well, um, you know, the, the interesting thing is I call it Herbert Hoover is his life is one of those where I call it gets knocked down and, get, and, and picks himself back up again and moves on on there from, uh, you know, just briefly, you know, being born in West Branch, uh, based, in this essence, his, his dad dies at six years old, his mom at nine, he's orphaned uh, at the age of nine years old. Um, uh, basically, uh, his uncle uh, uh, has one of his sons uh, pass away out in Oregon and in it essentially asked for uh, uh, the, fa the Hoover family to send Herbert out, out to Oregon. And, and I think it was more probably for he just needed an extra pair of hands to do all the work because you got to keep in mind this is in the mid 1880s. So Herbert Hoover, Bertie then, gets on a train in West Branch, two dimes sewn into his pocket and a small suitcase and heads to Oregon. I mean, it's just almost unbelievable. And it's it's not like you hop on Interstate 80 and drive out to Oregon now. I mean, just think what a train ride would have been like in the 1880s um, mm -hmm. on there. And if I correct me if I'm wrong, Tim, but I don't think that he had anybody travel with him either. Um, no, he on his own. Yeah. Yeah. So, so anyway, so he's out in Oregon, uh, and of course, you know, he's basically, you know, he's, he, he works right, right there in the family uh, home, and I've had a chance to visit it out in Newburgh, Oregon. Um, then the next break comes when uh, he gets a chance, uh, there's a new university opening out in uh, Palo Alto called uh, uh, Stanford University, and, and, uh, uh, and it's named after, a, uh, a, I call, I think it was Leland Stan, was it Leland Stanford? Uh, it was the... That, that, well, a senior paid for it, but it was in the honor of his deceased son, Junior. So it, right. you sometimes see it written out, Leland Stanford Junior University. It's Leland Stanford Junior, but it is a full university. Right, right. So, so anyway, so he starts at, uh, starts a university to honor his, uh, his uh, late son. Um, and one of the things on it is, is he realizes he's going to offer free tuition to kind of get things jump started. So Hoover, uh, you know, jumps at the chance, uh, basically takes his uh, test. Uh, to, you know, his uh, entrance exam and fails it on the first time. Fortunately, one of the proctors that had administered it uh, says, hey, I think, I think this, if I work with him a little bit, uh, I think, I think I can, you know, we can get him qualified, so forth like that. Uh, Hoover studies some more, works with the proctor, uh, takes the exam again and uh, passes. And so he's in Stanford's first class, so to speak, on there and uh, was in the first four year graduating there. After graduating then at uh, Stanford, uh, you know, then he gets, uh, he works his way into the mining uh, engineering field. Um, basically his first job, he worked for nothing uh, on there. Ultimately goes to Australia and uh, his first claim to fame is uh, he discovers in essence, the largest gold mine in uh, the world uh, on there. And uh, it's out in the, the middle of nowhere, so to speak. Um, he has a, a very successful there. The, then uh, his next opportunity comes when uh, he's basically promoted to uh, help with mining, I think, in China. And uh, at that time, then he comes, he makes a trip back to San Francisco, uh, in essence, and gets married to uh, Lou Henry Hoover, who was uh, born in Waterloo uh, on there. Uh, but they never knew each other in Iowa. It was out in, at Stanford is when they first met. Um, and that becomes a lifelong partnership there. Basically, he got married uh, to Lou Henry Hoover one day, and the next day they got on a steamer headed for China. 
um, basically went to China, got got involved in the middle of the Boxer Rebellion, uh, and uh, uh, ultimately ended up coming back, um, and ultimately became one of the most successful, I call mining engineers uh, in the world on there, was uh, very successful financially, um, was known as the doctor of sick mines. Um, and so he had uh, offices and consulting practices, I think on six of the continents uh, on there and uh, ultimately ended up in London, uh, um, England, uh, because that was kind of where the, the center hub of where mining activities and so forth like that took place. And, and uh, so he was there in 1914, World War I breaks out, then known as the Great War on there. And there's about 120,000 Americans that are stranded in Europe. And uh, Hoover's asked for help uh, from the American amb ambassador um, at, in England, uh, at London. And uh, so Hoover basically sets up shop in the Hotel Savoy. And uh, along with uh, Lou Henry, and he lists other volunteer, about 400 other volunteers. And ultimately over the course of several months between loaning money out, helping people get what they need, he helps get about 120,000 Americans back to the States on there. Um, meantime, um, the country of Belgium had been overrun uh, by Germany uh, as Germany cut through Belgium to go to France uh, and ultimately with, with the war. And uh, they thought with Belgium being a neutral country, they'd be able to slide right on through. That'd be easy to do. Well, Belgium decided to fight uh, on there. And uh, Belgium uh, has 80% of their food is imported. Well, that was all cut off and whatever food they had, the Germans were, co were confiscating for their own. And in essence, they told Belgium people, you, you're gonna have to just fend for yourselves on that. Um, ultimately, the uh, King of Belgium uh, had contacted, made contacts into London and uh, asked to speak to Hoover uh, on there and basically made the appeal to Hoover, um, you know, can you help us? Uh, saw what he did as far as getting 120,000 Americans home. And uh, ultimately then Hoover ended up uh, founding, I call the first uh, non-governmental organization, uh, the uh, Commission for the Relief of Belgium on there and uh, ultimately led food, mostly all mostly all volunteer help um, and ended up feeding, gosh, you know, the numbers always, you hear different numbers, Tim, but I mean, I think it's safe to say it was at least 10 million people uh, that he fed and saved from starvation uh, on there. And uh, ultimately um, at that point, uh, he had, he'd made the statement, he says, I think I started on the slippery road to public service uh, in essence, the last 50 years of his life, he spent, uh, he didn't take a salary and did in uh, either volunteer service, uh, leading the Commission for the Relief of Belgium, ultimately becoming Secretary of Commerce, uh, and then President of the United States, and then had a very uh, fruitful uh, post-presidential career that probably a lot of people overlook on there, so... Tim, feel free to chime in on that. And well, correct me where I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no, well done, well done. Um, what's interesting about that life, and you know, you look at other presidents, you say, what sort of impact did they make on on the quality of life uh, for the world, for the country, and so forth? And it's hard to find. Uh, many other presidents who have had as much impact on the quality of life of so many people around the world. And as Jerry would tell you, Herbert Hoover has a much higher reputation in Europe than he does in the United States, in part because uh, th there is a tendency to be uh, to, to, to create a caricature of Hoover. Uh, I used to tell people, if, if, if you think of, of the American people like the fair damsel who's been strapped to the, to the railroad track, uh, Herbert Hoover is depicted as Snidely Whiplash, and Franklin Roosevelt is Dudley Do Right. You may remember those cartoons from <laughs> from the nineteen sixties, uh, and uh, and so and so so that caricature tends to make Hoover seem like something of a villain or an incompetent. When in fact, if you look in the context of his times as president, uh, and, and as as we now face a tremendous crisis. Hoover basically generated more public spending, more public works projects. The National Archives building itself was an infrastructure project intended to jumpstart the economy. So the notion that somehow Hoover sat back, sat back and said, oh, the economy will take care of itself. We don't need to worry about the stock market. Not true at all. The problem is the size of the federal government was so much smaller than it was. 
Uh, and what people tend to forget, 1932, when Franklin Roosevelt ran against Herbert Hoover, he criticized Hoover for excessive spending and, in fact, said that he, Franklin Roosevelt, would balance the budget. Roosevelt never balanced the budget because he realized once he got into office, as most presidents do, oh, my goodness, this is far worse than I thought. It's going to take an enormous amount of spending. And in fact, the one thing, too, about about Roosevelt was he wasn't wed to any one philosophy. He would try something. If it didn't work, he'd try something else. So he was very flexible. And ultimately, too, as a communicator, he was very effective at convincing the American people to follow him. And that was a challenge for Hoover. Hoover was somewhat reclusive. He, he didn't cotton, oddly enough, to, to this new technology of radio, as Jerry would tell you. He used to compare it to talking to a bathroom doorknob, talking to a microphone. He, d- he liked eye contact. He was very good at one-to-one meetings. But the idea of speaking to this audience, so I don't think you'd get Herbert Hoover on a Zoom conference. I was just uh, wondering if, if that was what you would like. <laughs> the, the other question, of course, uh, it just occurred to me when Jerry was talking about the modesty of Hoover's uh, birthplace. Can you imagine in a COVID-19 crisis being stuck in a cottage the size of the one that Herbert Hoover was born in? You know, it's about <laughs> about 100 square feet, if that. And now, of course, you could have gotten outside because you could easily social distance in West Branch at that time. But <laughs> at, at any rate, the, the impact that Hoover's life made on so many others, 10 million in Belgium, but then so many other programs, even in this country, and great monuments, the Golden Gate Bridge, Hoover Dam, many of these projects were, were begun. The so-called Federal Triangle, which in, in downtown Washington, as you drive down Pennsylvania Avenue, includes the, uh, the uh, Justice Department, the National Archives, uh, the Federal Trade Commission building, and so forth, all started in the Hoover administration. The, oddly enough, c- considering COVID, here's a, here's a brag point. Uh, the uh, National Institutes of Health, which is so much a part of our response today, was established by Herbert Hoover. So, you know, you get into a situation where you say, once you become t- and absorb many of the facts, you say, huh, I really need to modify the way I think about, about Hoover's life and contributions based on impact. Well, Tim, wouldn't you agree that one of the things that uh, uh, was really impactful for Herbert Hoover becoming president was obviously a, a, a seven or eight year career as Secretary of Commerce, mm-hmm. both under Harding and under Calvin Coolidge. Well, in fact, you, you go back to, to FDR and some of the comments he made. Of course, he he was a, a colleague. I wouldn't say they were close friends, but he, Roosevelt and uh, Hoover served both in the Wilson administration and, in fact, worked together in using Navy ships. Franklin Roosevelt was assistant secretary of the Navy to also ship food and supplies to the Allies during the war. So, and they continued to maintain uh, communication. Roosevelt was a, an association executive, like Jerry, back in the 20s, the American Construction Council, working with Herbert Hoover, again, Secretary of Commerce, Housing Standards. The two by four was established as a standard board foot for, uh, for wall studs and so forth in the 1920s. So there was a lot of collaboration. I think, in fact, there's an article somewhere in which Roosevelt speculated whether or not Herbert Hoover was really human. He just seemed to be an extraordinary individual, kind of a superhero. So there was widespread uh, admiration. Roosevelt then, of course, runs as governor. That's where the point of separation begins. When, when Roosevelt is a governor, and of course we see this now, tensions between governors and the, the, the federal government, or the executive. So that's where it begins in the 19, uh, the, the, or the, during the, Rose, or the, the Hoover administration. Roosevelt, uh, as head of the, the largest state in the country at the time, was a, was a leader, there's a point of friction. They, of course, then end up as political rivals in the 32 campaign, and, and it goes from there. And in fact, tactically speaking, whenever Roosevelt found himself in trouble, and as did Truman, if they wanted to sort of rally people around them, they'd say, be careful if you don't do what I want. In effect, we'll go back to the bad old days of of the Great Depression. So they basically sustained and nurtured this image of Hoover as a as a either a do-nothing president or a, a malfeasant president. Hoover himself would not rise to the bait. He would not defend himself, which was probably a mistake because Americans have such short attention spans when it comes to history. Yeah. In fact, uh, you know, a lot of people, I think uh, uh, Tim don't realize that 
Herbert Hoover, you know, with the, uh, his Secretary of Commerce years, I mean, in essence, he had, uh, you know, led the food relief, uh, you know, and saved millions, you know, from starvation during, you know, during uh, the Great War, was very successful as far as an organizer, uh, you know, at Secretary of Commerce, and of course, the Mississippi floods, he was, he was central on that, is that he actually won the 1928 election in a landslide. I mean, yeah. it was yeah. 57 to 41 percent. Well, as Jerry knows, we we helped to produce a, a, a film uh, which has its flaws, but it's called Landslide. And it is true. He he won in a landslide in 28 and he lost in a landslide in 32. It's the mercurial nature of leadership, because, of course, you are you're kind of uh, hoisted on the petard of, of people's expectations. And Hoover had been so successful. It's virtually everything he had done that when he became president following eight years of, of really, I don't say, laissez-faire government, of, of boom years, not in agriculture, initially enough. as we all know, if anyone knows Iowa history knows, really, the depression in Iowa starts in 1921, and it's just bad times all the way through until the war. Uh, but around the rest of the country, there were boom times. And then, of course, it comes crashing down with an unregulated... It, it's really the lack of regulation in the economy. And it wasn't so much just the stock market. We use the metaphor of the crash in 29, but relatively few people had money invested in the stock market. Yes, people lost money, but that became the metaphor for a larger general retrenchment in the economy. So that, uh, and we still to this day, you know, measure how are we doing based on how many points we've lost in the Dow. But in fact, it's all those people, those small businesses that can't open. And those, I'd say the more important thing today is the agitation that's going on in state capitals to open the country up because what you see are desperate people. Uh, and you saw desperate people in the 30s. There were people who wondered whether democracy would survive or not. So kudos is deserved to Franklin Roosevelt without diminishing the role that Herbert Hoover played. I do like to remind people when they talk about the hundred days of Franklin Roosevelt, those first hundred days of his a new deal. And I say, where did those, those programs come from? They were all in Congress proposed by Herbert Hoover. The, the, the early new deal, the first hundred days is the Hoover new deal, not the Roosevelt new deal. I think that's pretty fascinating. And then um, the other piece, I mean, I mean it's a couple of the areas that really, um, that I found most interesting was what we talked about the World War I and what he did in World War I, but then the post-presidency I found pretty interesting too and in helping the administrations that followed him and what he did in that regard, especially considering, like you mentioned, the caricature he had become, but going beyond that um, and basically almost ignoring that and, and what he right. was able to do after his presidency, I found fascinating. Yeah. So maybe you can fill people in on that a little well, bit. Uh, Brett brings up an interesting point because it's been in the news of late, uh, and I don't mean to be unduly critical of President Trump, but he was asked why he has not brought his predecessors in uh, to work with him, consult with him, to be ambassadors for various programs, as all of his predecessors had done with their predecessors. And he's made a decision that there is no value in talking to Presidents Bush or Clinton or Carter and, and, and so forth. I think that's a mistake because if you look at Hoover's role and the relationship between Hoover and Truman in particular, Hoover becomes an ambassador for the Marshall Plan. And in fact, had worked with George Marshall in developing the plan and gave Harry Truman, who was a relatively weak president in 46 and 47, no one thought he would be reelected as president in 48. He gave Truman the cover to go and help relieve the hunger and poverty and, and uh, revolution that was fomenting in Europe after World War II. That was an enormous contribution. He traveled to 38 countries in this beat up old DC-3 called the Faithful Cow. I mean, it is truly amazing, as Jerry will tell you, how much energy a man in his 70s can have. But he was a workaholic. I mean, he was probably to the last month of his life, working on a book, on a speech, on something. He did refuse the opportunity in 1962 to be an honorary chairman of the Peace Corps. He had a strong relationship with, uh, with the Kennedy family, a good friend of Joe Kennedy's. Joe Kennedy served on two different commissions that Hoover was chair uh, and, and really was an advocate of the Kennedy presidency, helped to broker, Hoover, helped to broker peace between Richard Nixon and John F. Kennedy 
after the 1960 election, you may remember that the 60 election was razor thin. Really, a few votes in Illinois made the difference. And Nixon was encouraged to demand a recount, to basically freeze the country until it could be decided. Hoover got Kennedy and Nixon together in Florida, and they talked it out. Nixon agreed that it was the best for the country was that he basically concede Kennedy becomes president. So there's, I mean, it's truly amazing what a man of that age, former presidents are great, not just role models, but they're, they're a, a valued asset, a treasure we should be using. Uh, if not daily, we should be using on a regular basis as George W. Bush did, as George H. W. Bush did, as Harry Truman did, Eisenhower and Kennedy and so forth. Yeah, I'd, I'd throw in a plug too, as one of the things that we started our third Thursday series um, um, at, the, at the Library Museum, and of course now we're doing it virtually, but our May uh, third Thursday program is going to be uh, with the uh, current library director at, uh, at Hoover, Tom Schwartz, and the current uh, library director at Truman, uh, uh, Kurt Graham, and they're going to do a program on that Truman uh, transition when he became president, uh, at, you know, and uh, Yes, and in essence, he had been, you know, vice president only 100 days, and uh, after FDR died, Hoover was the only living president left, and uh, so they're going to, that'll be that program on that, so, um, it, and if you want to just check the Hoover Presidential Foundation site, uh, we'll have links and so forth like that, but that'll be a Zoom conference just like this one as well. Very good. I'll try to remember to put the foundation link in here in the chat box so folks can find it later. Um, we did have one good question. It's one that I'd be interested in too, because when I go to presidential libraries, I always ask the people in the gift shop, what's the, the best biography you have? And then I always buy it and I take it and I read it. So um, we did have somebody ask, uh, um, she said, clearly I need to read up on Hoover. Any recommendations for a balanced biography? Jerry, do you want to offer your choice? Well, um, I, I would say it depends on how much time you got. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. I mean, I think that, um, yeah, you know, and, and of course, the, the, the Hoover Library Association commissioned a six volume series on Herbert Hoover, and which they've got a book that will take a certain aspect of his life. Um, and we have four different authors did that. Uh, in fact, I think, Tim, you were helping involved, kind of helped wrap that whole project up. Yeah, we did. On there. It's a very in-depth, involved um, um, series on there. And so, I mean, it's a six volume series. And, and uh so yeah, I would say that, that that's the complete works. I, if you want to do just one book though, the latest one that I've seen by Kenneth White and I, and, and I think it's pretty, mm -hmm. you know, it's not uh, Hoover rah rah. It's, you know, he'll, right. he'll uh, take, take critical shots at, uh, at Hoover too, but I think that book's been pretty good. Yeah, I, I would agree completely that it, what, what has been heartening in my time, because when I came in at 88, uh, it was picking up uh, at Luke's point, I think it was, there really have, were very few biographies available. At the time, of David Berner had done a book in 1978. I think we went a whole decade without anybody doing any biographies. Mm -hmm. Since I've retired, or as we have worked uh, uh, go going forward during my time uh, there, uh, and we completed the six volumes. A number of scholars have stepped forward. Glenn Jensen, uh, uh, who did several biographies and uh, studies of Her Hoover, and uh, 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 Charles, what's his name? I can't remember his last. There was another fellow. Uh, anyway, a, a number of, of, of biographies. So there's no shortage, but go with the white biography to start. And the other thing I would also say, uh, to, to put in a plug for, for anyone who's exploring this, Go to the website of these presidential libraries, type in the, the title Herbert Hoover Presidential Library, and you'll get the Hoover website itself, which is different from the foundation's website. And that'll give you links to a lot of documents and other information that get you started, get you a little taste, kind of like dim sum, you know, or an appetizer. Very good. I have a couple of Hoover biographies on my bookcase. I'm going to check to see if that's the one. <laughs> New, newest is usually the best because, you know, in history, as we write history, we really do build on the on the shoulders of, of giants or, or stand on the shoulders of giants. So so the newest biographies tend to be more complete. I will say this, unlike other presidents, Hoover's papers are all completely available. There's I can't think if there's any document that's restricted. 
there, there is, because of privacy and national security concerns, restrictions on large amounts of material at almost every other president. There's still Eisenhower materials that are being restricted. And we won't see the last of access to, say, current presidents like Bush or Clinton until the, the, the uh, 22nd century. So the, the, the bottom line is, uh, if, you, if you want something that's complete and definitive, Hoover's a, a good bet. And that's because, again, we didn't have as much in the way of national security. We didn't have copy machines where you have huge volumes. Obama's information is largely electronic. Now, it might help some points of access, but on the other hand, it's, the volume is going to be overwhelming. It'll, it would, it's not going to be possible for any one individual to see or read every document created during the Obama administration mm -hmm. right. or Trump. Go. I think another thing that might be interesting to talk about is what does the Hoover Library and the foundation and the historic site and everything there, what does that do for Iowa today? Well, that's a great question. Um, you know, and I, I'll use the shameless plug, it's Iowa's only presidential library museum. And frankly, probably will be at least for the next 20 to 25 years, unless, you know, somebody from Iowa really emerges, uh, you know, on a national scope. Um, you know, becomes president. Of course, then after they get done with president, it's a five to eight year process putting together a presidential library, you know, and museum uh, together on that. But uh, the thing that I would say on it is, is it really is an Iowa treasure. It's something that Iowa, Iowans can be very proud of on there. And, uh, you know, Brett, you mentioned it yourself, and, and I had numerous people told me, and it's the one bugaboo that we always work against, is people drive right by West Branch, and they'll see the Herbert Hoover library and uh, you know exit and so forth like that and they'll they just don't stop and uh you know and i had so many people say oh yeah i've been by you know when i took this job seven years ago from des moines and they'd say oh yeah i've seen the sign I, i've never stopped but uh, i see the sign i know where it's at and then when i once i start getting people out and it's like wow i never knew that in fact that's probably the phrase that we hear after they visit the hoover campus is i never knew that and one of the things that we're really working on trying to change is is instead of, uh, you know, in addition to, I never knew that, and you got to come and see it on there. So, um, you know, Tim Tim was uh, uh, there when the uh, last renovation and expansion of the library was done in 1992. And, and of course, Brett, you know, as a, as a board trustee, you're aware as, you know, we're, we're working on a, basically we've chosen a concept design firm and we're looking at doing a, a museum renovation. And, you know, it's been, it'll be over 30 years by the time we get it done, which is uh, eons uh, for a presidential library. So we're looking at reinvesting in it and, and making it something that people are really going to want to come and see on there. It's a great museum now, and it's going to be even greater, I think, when we get the renovation done. And I think yeah. what's fascinating to me traveling around is each of the libraries tends to, in my opinion, um, almost take on the personality of that president. And that's what's fascinating to me. You go to the mall and they feel a lot like you, like the idea you have of that president. And so in West Branch, it's very quintessentially Iowa. And I think that's that's one of the nice things about it is, um, which Jerry is, is virtually in, in, or literally in West Branch, I'm virtually in West Branch, but um, <laughs> that's the picture of the library behind <laughs> and, and what it looks like today. Um, or not exactly today, but a year or two ago or whenever I took that photo. Um, but yeah, I, th I think that's that's pretty neat, um, the legacy there. And for me, I'm the same way. I don't stop unless I can see something generally. So, and and you could see it if there were tall enough sign, but yeah, like like I need the golden arches or something to beckon me off the highway when I'm traveling through. I think one, well, of, the, one of the challenges is, as Jerry will tell you, and that is back in the fifties and sixties, when gas was cheap, and I'm old enough to remember paying 29 cents a gallon for gasoline, and that wasn't a gas war, that was what it cost. Um, <laughs> people would get into their wood paneled station wagon with their six kids, and they would drive to various historic sites because dad felt it was important as part of the summer education of the kids. More now, people are flying to, to endpoint destinations like a theme park or, or some other location. And although they do visit the natural sites, they're, all of the presidential libraries and mu historical museums struggle to draw people off highways if they're on the highways, because as often as not, they're in an airplane. Now, of course, who knows what's going to happen in a post-COVID world? Maybe people will be more likely to drive rather than putting themselves at risk in airplanes. So we'll just have to see how it goes. 
on that plus side, what's the impact of having a presidential library in your state? Well, as small as Hoover site is in the library, it's by the way, the second largest site, Roosevelt's a little larger in terms of land area. It's the smallest presidential museum. We're about 50,000 square feet, but it pumps about, oh, two and a half million dollars plus. It's got a, a, a denominator there too, uh, that, that adds to the, the, the value that, that's pumped into the economy of the state through salaries and other, uh, uh, other expenses that, that are absorbed by the federal government. So it's, it's a real asset. And when you figure that over 50 or 75 years, it's a real contribution from the federal government to the quality of life in Iowa. And as Jerry and all of you guys have suggested, People like to know that it's there. They like to know there's a place to visit if, if their brother-in-law is coming in from, you know, someplace else. And as we all have learned, people have a very low expectation when they go there and always leave feeling that the time was well spent. I never in my time at Hoover had anyone say, boy, was I disappointed. Whereas with other presidential libraries, sometimes they'll go in and they'll say, gosh, that was kind of flat or disappointing, or I thought you know, uh, it would have more about this or they whitewashed that or, you know, so uh, I, I think we, we've got a good story. I think it's told fairly. As Jerry has suggested, time tends to diminish uh, the story, if only because there's so much interactivity going on now. Kids want uh, touch screen. They want all kinds of things. And the government's not going to pay for that. They'll pay for the, the, the building. They'll maintain the staff. But if there's going to be a new museum, there are going to be programs. It's going to be up to, to Jerry and Brett and, and their colleagues on the board. Yeah. The, the one nice thing about the, the Hoover campus is, is everything is there. I mean, you've got the birthplace cottage. And, and in essence, it's, I call almost a recreation of how things could have been in the 1880s when Hoover actually lived in West Branch. So, and you've got the blacksmith shop where his father Jesse started. And, and frankly, for kids, young, young kids, that's the most interesting thing they they usually find and they'll make comments on on there but uh you know quaker meeting house schoolhouse and of course his gravesite and uh it's 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 a beautiful park and library museum uh again is you know i think that's what tim's uh point is very good is people are it's always exceeds expectations after they make a visit it's like wow this is better than what i i was maybe anticipating on something like that so and even uh, like Monday mentioned, the sight line between the the birth site and the grave site and things like that you don't realize are are um, it's all tied together there. Yeah, yeah, and uh, so so they get, yeah. Then what Brett's referring to is you can actually look out the back door of the uh, uh, birthplace cottage uh, and and there's a complete view sight line to the grave site, which is on the hill to the just to the southwest on there, and then likewise back and. Uh, uh, yeah, it's 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 a beautiful campus. I mean, um, and it's you know, of course, now it's starting to green up, and and Brett must have took a picture right at its height of glory there. But uh, yeah, it is it, it's a great place to visit, uh, and there and you could spend as little as a couple hours there. You could spend four to six hours very easily there too. Mm -hmm. If you're like me and read everything, you're probably looking at four <laughs> to six. <laughs> yeah, so maybe. I think a good thing to talk about is the future of both the Hoover campus and probably like Tim hit on just what he sees coming with the libraries in general, because I know that was one thing I wasn't fully aware of is the difference that the Obama um, library will be and maybe what that might look like going forward. Um, just to speak, of course, the size of these institutions have grown from just being a modest, maybe a center or a library to almost being uh, a, a presidential complex, because many of them have schools of public service, they'll have uh, uh, conference centers, they might have a presidential apartment. I mean, I'll tell just a quick story. Uh, in 1969, February 69, after he'd left office, Lyndon Johnson had to go to the Mayo Clinic. So he was flying up to, uh, to, to uh, Rochester. And there was a stopover, he decided to make a stopover, in, because he was thinking about his own presidential library, make a stopover in in Iowa, and he, he stopped in at Cedar Rapids and said he was going to visit the, the Hoover Presidential Library. Now, if you're old enough, I'm maybe the only one here who's old enough to remember in 1969, uh, Lyndon Johnson was a persona non grata. People blamed the Vietnam War. He was, he'd left office to some extent being pushed out. Um, 
But he got to West Branch and the crowds were huge and enormous and they were just cheering him. And it just buoyed him so much to have these people from the heartland and from Iowa show uh, the uh, this appreciation. Well, it was a very modest building. It was only about four or 5,000 square feet at the time. I, maybe the auditorium, yeah, the auditorium had opened up. So maybe a few more than that. So anyway, Johnson gave his talk and went to Mayo and came back to, to Austin, Texas, where he was going to build his own library. And he got his small staff together and he said, you know, I was ju just up there in West Branch and I want to build a presidential library just like the one they have in West Branch. And of course, if you've been to the Johnson Library, you know it's nothing like <laughs> it's seven story marble complex with a helicopter pad on the roof and a presidential apartment and a school of public service and below ground archival storage. I mean, it's just and that's Lyndon Johnson. You know, <laughs> it says one thing and does something completely different. But as Brett raises the question about the size and the footprint of these libraries is, you know, as long as the president's friends and associates are willing to take physical custody as Obama is and pay for and maintain these buildings, they can do whatever they would like. And just like the, the amount of money that's spent on presidential campaigns is growing exponentially, these could be, I don't say they get grow to the size of Disney World, but they're gonna grow much bigger than they currently are. Particularly if you look at the four older libraries, the the ones from Hoover and Roosevelt, Truman and Eisenhower, they're all a little different, but they're all located in a kind of a birthplace or boyhood location. They're fairly modest in pretense. Compared those to say the newer ones, say Obama and Trump and so forth, they're just going to be, uh, they're gonna be spectacles. Um, and I suppose Congress and the press will continue to, to criticize them. What's likely is that the access, there will always be a federal presence which means in effect, they will maintain the physical records and the digital assets in an offsite location. And if you go to do research on Trump or you go to do research on Obama and so forth, you'll go to a room and you'll get access. And then of course, there'll be a point where they put a lot of that stuff online. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's changing, it's evolving. In the meantime, Jerry and Brett and, and, and those people who are working for and maintaining the older presidential libraries have money to raise and to keep to refresh the story and to keep people interested in coming back to to those locations. Yeah, because that, that's one thing I've thought about. I know the Obama library would be very grand. And then knowing, knowing President Trump's personality, he's going to want the biggest and the best. So yeah. I can just Count, imagine what that's going to look like. It's going to be in, I think, on Mar-a-Lago. I can't believe it. Well, there, there won't be there's not enough land in Manhattan that's available. <laughs> <laughs> so it won't be in the tower. So my guess, and I don't think in New Jersey, I think uh, probably Florida. Yeah. Maybe Florida's first. Yeah, I was going to say there's not one down there. It's kind of no, nice no. Have geographically spread so you can see them in different places. Yeah. So well, yeah, thing, you mentioned a little bit about what Hoover's planning, but with the refresh, but what, what do you think folks might, might want to know about that? Well, um, you know, I, I would say, you know, we, we've chosen a concept design firm. Uh, we interviewed, uh, uh, we, we asked uh, eight or nine to uh, uh, put requests for qualifications in. Uh, we interviewed six, uh, invited six to the campus and did, did interview, or excuse me, we uh, invited four to the campus. And, and really we had some firms that came in that have done other, a lot of other, the other presidential libraries uh, on there. Ultimately we chose BRC Imagination Arts and people are gonna say, so who's that? Now, Tim, Tim knows who it oh, is. Oh yeah on there, but BRC Imagination Arts is the one that did the Lincoln Presidential Library Museum in Springfield, and that was in the early 2000s, and, and uh, you know, they did a, a terrific job. Of course, that was a, the state of Illinois paid a, a huge chunk of money <laughs> for that uh, on there, and, uh, but one of the things on it is, is, and of course, I sat through the, uh, all the interviews, and it became pretty clear to me that probably BRC was, was the best one, and, and I think the feeling from the, uh, the committee that chose BRC Imagination Arts is, is all of those uh, concept design firms would give us a good presidential library but or uh, museum, but we really thought that BRC would probably make it a great one on there. So um, the board will, you know, that'll become for approval. Or actually, I think they've already approved the expenditure on there, but uh, they'll make a presentation to our board uh, next, next week, and uh, hopefully we'll get started on that. And uh, it's gonna be pretty exciting times. Uh, 
you know, we, we won't be the Lincoln Presidential Library, but I think that uh, as far as they really do a great job, we thought as far as telling the Hoover story and pulling out the emotions uh, and because that's really what people connect with on there. So uh, it's, it's gonna be pretty exciting times. It's a long time frame. I mean, the timeline we got right now and the goal is uh, Hoover's 150th birthday will be August 10th of 2024. And that's kind of our goal to be, uh, have our uh, grand reopening done by then, so. One thing I would tell uh, uh, you know anybody too, uh, Brett, is is the the nice thing with the presidential libraries. And of course, you've had a chance to visit them. And if people are interested in visiting presidential libraries, one of the easiest ways to do it is become a member of one of the presidential foundations of one of the thirteen NARA libraries on there. Of course, I'd be partial to Hoover uh, on there, but uh, we have a reciprocal agreement with all the other. President, the 13 NARA presidential uh, foundations and libraries. So if you're a member of the Hoover Presidential Foundation, I mean, not only do you get to come to the Hoover Library and Museum as often as you want, you know, uh, you know, free, but then you also get to go to the other presidential libraries free as well on there. So if you were thinking about going to California and visiting the Reagan and the Nixon libraries, really, uh, it makes the most sense probably to join the Hoover Presidential Foundation and you know, you'll get access to Hooper for a year and you'll be able to get in at a lot lower cost if you go to California on that. So, and the other thing that we've really started doing uh, since I came is visiting pres other presidential libraries. We do a presidential library trip every year. Uh, two years ago, we went, went and did the Texas libraries, George W. Bush, uh, George H. W. Bush, and, uh, um, and then also the Lyndon Johnson uh, library on there. So. We visited every presidential library now, except for Jimmy Carter, who we were supposed to do just last month. And we've had to postpone that because of COVID-19. And we're working on rescheduling that. Hopefully we can do that in late September, provided everything you know at least opens up back then. Uh, and then we've got the Clinton Library, which you haven't been to. So kind of Clinton was gonna be our, our fall trip. And now we probably pushed that. We're gonna have to probably do that one in 2021. But uh, great way to visit presidential libraries because frankly, when we go in, we're treated like royalty uh, on there because it's, it's that camaraderie and they'll take us behind the scenes and, and show us different things. And uh, uh, just as we would at Hoover, if we have a group from uh, one of the other presidential libraries, we roll, we, in fact, one of the things that I picked up off of Nixon when we were out there is they actually rolled the red carpet out for us. And so guess what? Hoover's got a red carpet now that we can roll out. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Very cool. Yeah, and I think that is a great benefit. I would definitely encourage folks to join the Presidential Foundation. Um, it, it, you definitely get your money's worth if, if you're interested in seeing the other ones. And mm -hmm. so, um, yeah, and supporting Iowa's Presidential Library, that's the reason why I ended up joining the Hoover one. I think I think it's fascinating that we have it here. It's great that we have it here. I showed Luke early before we started. I brought a little, there you go. Oh. There's <laughs> brought my bobblehead down. So um, it, it's definitely, it. most states don't have anything like that, especially states our size. So mm -hmm. Luke, any questions you have left that you are interested about? Uh, I could go on for a couple more hours. But I know <laughs> uh, um, you mentioned you know, the fact that with the, with the COVID virus right now, everything's kind of closed. I saw on the website, there's some stuff about some uh, distance learning modules that you guys have on there. I didn't know if you wanted to talk about that at all um, while we're here. Sure, I could. Uh, there, there's a couple different things. Uh, one is, is the presidential libraries are, are sharing some different uh, programs and modules that they got. So uh, uh, of the 13 uh, National Archives libraries. So there's, if you go to the Hoover uh, Presidential Library Museum, uh, the easiest way is to Google Pre Hoover Presidential Library Museum and it'll pull up. Uh, and there's different programs there. And especially for when kids are at home right now, it's a great way to learn on there. And there's mm -hmm. also, we're making a bigger push too to put more shared programming. You know, for instance, one of the things that, you know, obviously we're doing the third Thursday of May with, with uh, uh, the Truman Library uh, and the Truman Institute is, is partnering up there. I, I know FDR, uh, the FDR Library Director and uh, the Hoover Library Director just did a program on the Hoover Roosevelt transition uh, on there. And uh, I think we're, I'm not sure when that's gonna be put up, but we're gonna to work together to make that available too. So there's a lot of resources out there. Um, and the other is, is uh, Hoover's got a great education specialist 
and she's done some great programs specifically for kids. Uh, and uh, there is a, there's links there. And I would really encourage um, that uh, uh, kids take a look at that because it, it really is a great program and it's set up for distance learning. A great question. I, I yes. think folks are looking for unique homeschooling type topics. Yeah. So I think right. For folks to know. Yeah, I, I had one more, you know, obviously with the museum closed right now, but um, when you two go, you, you two have been there hundreds, if not thousands of times, I'm sure spent a lot of time there for decades. What's the one uh, exhibit or, or item on display, something that you will go to, to, to see every time? or the most. I'll jump in here because we did a conference at uh, the Truman Library back in the 50th anniversary of the Truman Library. And we were asked as library directors, what is our favorite thing for each president? And my selection was the display of flower sacks because it shows in a very concrete, very poignant way, the gratitude that the people of Belgium had for what Hoover did. He stepped up as a private citizen and saved their lives. What could they give him in return? So the women of Belgium embroidered the printing that was on the sacks, the English words that they perhaps couldn't read, or perhaps they designed something original. And there are hundreds of these unique flower sacks. It's something that resonates with us as Iowans because it's food, but it also shows the importance of our ability to reach out to others in need. We see this now in our country today. So that's, to me, day in, day out, those flower sacks, those embroidered flower sacks are a way of, of people saying thanks, just the way we're, we're thanking first responders. Yeah, and and I, I would probably say mine is, is just the, the birthplace cottage. I mean, it, you know, I, I made the mistake early on. I was talking once and, and Margaret Hoover was uh, there and I said something about two bedroom cottage and she goes, no, Jerry, two room cottage. <laughs> <laughs> it really is on there. But it, when you have somebody that come from such humble beginnings and becomes president of the United States and it was right here in Iowa, it is really just an unbelievable story. And to Tim's point too, with the flower sacks, the appreciation, a real quick story is, uh, there was visitors about three years ago to the library, and they, they, they told somebody at the front desk, well, we left something up at the graveside, hope it was okay, blah, 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 uh, on there. And so the library director went up there the next morning and looked, and there was uh, flowers uh, uh, left there at the gravesite with a note uh, to Herbert Hoover about so much appreciation for saving our lives. And the, this couple had been from Belgium on there. And I mean, that they, they, they came all the way to Iowa basically to do that. And, and, and we see that a lot of times with visitors on that. So great story, great appreciation. Kind of reflected on recently is we're in our own humanitarian crisis and you know thinking about what Hoover might have to say about some of the challenges we're going through now. And um, that, that's a whole nother hour plus topic in itself. So <laughs> but just, just learning from history and um, what he did to, to feed Belgium and um, the great humanitarian efforts that, that he did. So, well, um, he was known as the master of emergencies, and uh, yeah, we could use him right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, for those who do want to go to the to the museum when it when it does reopen after all this, what are the normal hours of operation? Good, uh, good point. The, uh, they're nine to five, uh, seven days a week, uh, three hundred and sixty-two days a year. The only days that the library is closed our Christmas, New Year's, and Thanksgiving on that. And as far as, uh, uh, you know, the library museum is closed right now, as are all uh, as all museums are uh, on there. And they really don't have a projection yet when they're gonna open uh, on there. I just had a conversation again yesterday and, and just don't know, uh, you know, we'll see. But obviously uh, when they do, we're gonna make a big deal out of it because uh, um, one of the things I think, you know, we really like, I think people, um, are going to be reluctant to take longer vacations. One is, is just because of the, the, the travel and the planning and so forth like that. I think it's going to be more stay close to home and the Hoover Library Museum will be a great place to visit this summer because you can hop in the car, drive over there. Um, you know, it's smaller. Um, it'll be, a, it'll be a good, safe environment. I, I think probably Hoover will be one of the, the earlier presidential library museums to open just because we're in a, a smaller uh, 
maybe I would even say rural area. I mean, West Branch is only 2,300 people rather than, uh, you know, for instance, one that is in the middle of Dallas or the middle of LA or so forth like that. So, yeah. As an airline pilot, I really hope people do fly and decide to fly to Cedar Rapids <laughs> uh, to come to the museum. But uh, I, I also have three kids. Luke and I chuckling at each other when <laughs> my, people want to fly, air, fly in airplanes. <laughs> yeah. I do have three kids, though. The oldest is 12, and they're, they're the perfect age to be coming to this. So I, I, I've been looking every summer. I look for a few good hot spots in, in the state of Iowa to show them the state. And this is a perfect example as well. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm hoping we can bring them there this summer to, to take a look for the first time yeah. for that. And another I, idea I've kicked around is even taking an Aveda bus trip out to the to the library. So if folks are watching and you would might have an interest in that, let us know, um, kind of want to gauge what interest might be there. But maybe when it opens up, we'll hop on a bus together and drive on over to West Branch and check it out. We'd be love great to have you inside with an Iowa football game as well. Yeah, <laughs> I would always be great. <laughs> That, that that has been done and uh, I can tell you if we do that we'll make sure we give you the VIP experience. <laughs> yeah, I, I've definitely done the whole go to the, the library on a Friday and go to a game on a Saturday before I have done that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah anything else you have left Luke or gentlemen anything you have you want to share? Great. Um, I hope folks enjoyed the program this morning. We appreciate um, Jerry and Tim sharing your information, like Luke said, I could probably sit here half the day and, and learn more. And it's, it's pretty fascinating, I think. Um, you can even tell by some of the comments, folks learn things they didn't already mm -hmm. know. So we, we appreciate your time this morning. Thanks for Don't having forget. us. Thanks for Thank having you. us. Mm -hmm. Thank you. you